is going to be from Matthew 2, verses 13 through 18. Now when the wise men had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, said, Rise, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt, remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child, to destroy him. He rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. And he remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I've called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he became furious. He sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all their region who were two years old or under, according to the time he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping, loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they were no more. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. There's much tragedy in the world, so much so that life sometimes poetically has been called a veil of tears valley full of tears. Sorrow always seems to be close at hand, even when we have times of joy. And yet the message we hear on the first Christmas is that life has a purpose. And not only a purpose, but a goodness that's greater than anything we could even conceive to ask for. God's goodness to us is expressed at that time when, as the song says, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in me tonight. Sometimes we forget, however, that tragedy was part of the Christmas story, too. And yet it was a tragedy within a greater context, a greater perspective of God's goodness. This is what we find in our text here. As soon as the wise men had departed, Joseph is warned in a dream, Arise, take the child, his mother, flee him into Egypt. Be there until I tell you. Herod's about to seek the child in order to kill him. And so we have a hardship for this young family that it's soon after the child is born, they have to become exiles, refugees, as we think of so many refugees in our world today. They have to live away from their home all the time until Herod eventually dies. There's a greater context, though, to that tragedy for this family. When they will be able to return, we're told by Matthew that this will fulfill the word by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Now Hosea is that prophet, and he's pointing back to a time in Israel when they were slaves in Egypt, and yet they become uh, delivered through the Lord's work, hand, the Lord's work. And he's also, Hosea is pointing ahead to a future time when once again Israel is going to have to live within another country. They're going to be exiled in Babylon. And yet once again, the Lord will deliver them as well. And so Jesus, as Israel's Messiah, who has to fulfill all of the history of Israel, will have to himself experience an exile and a deliverance even as being just a young child. Now more tragedy occurs as Herod realized that he's been tricked, as this translation said, it could be translated disregarded or disrespected. No king who thinks he's in charge of everything wants to be disrespected and, and have people treat him that way. So it says that he raged exceedingly and sending soldiers killed all the male children not just in Bethlehem, but in the whole region around there, just for good measure. And not just newborns, but two years old and under, because of the time when the wise men had first seen the star. So it's a horrible, cruel event. And yet it's placed in a greater perspective. As Matthew tells us, and there was fulfilled the Lord's word through Jeremiah the prophet, saying, a voice was heard in Ramah, weeping, much mourning, Rachel weeping over her children, and she was not wishing to be comforted, because they are not. 
Jeremiah is referring, again, just like Hosea in the second part, is referring to a time when all of Israel is going to be in exile in Egypt, or in Babylon, sorry. And as a people, it seems as if they were no more. So uh, Rachel, one of Jacob or Israel's uh, wives that helped to bear part of the 12 tribes, is weeping during this time. But in the very next verse of Jeremiah, we hear the Lord's word, Keep your voice from weeping, your eyes from tears, for Israel will come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord. So once again, we see tragedy, yes, but we see a greater perspective. We see something bigger. And so even in this tragedy in Bethlehem of the death of so many children, we can say because who this child is that was born in a manger, that God is bringing goodness even for those children who died and for their parents. Now obviously we nor anybody else, I'm sure the parents at the time didn't see that goodness with their eyes. Who could think anything good could come out of anything like that? But we can say by faith, not by our regular way of seeing that life has a purpose, and that purpose is filled with God's goodness. We know this because all of the Lord's words were fulfilled in that child Jesus. All life and its purpose revolves around Jesus. And so tragedies must be seen in a greater perspective so that we can even see something as horrible as the death of a child in a bigger perspective. That's what Max Ellerbush experienced uh, one Christmas season. He grew up, he said, expecting uh, never to find a loving God at work in life. His dad used to say that in all the dad's childhood, he did not experience one act of charity or Christian kindness. The dad had grown up in 18th or 19th century Germany, which was supposed to be a Christian nation at the time, but uh, he was an orphan, and orphans were very uh, often commonly rented out to farmers, some of whom treated uh, them like a piece of machinery, or even worse. Uh, so Max said he grew up in a, into a stern, brooding man who looked uh, upon life as an unassisted journey to the grave. Max's father married another orphan, and after children started coming, he decided to immigrate to America. He landed in New York and ended up in Cincinnati, where a lot of other German immigrants were there, and he got many jobs for a while, and then eventually, after a year and a half, was able to have enough money to send for the family to come over. Max said two of his sisters, though, died in Ellis Island from scarlet fever they contracted on the voyage over. He said something and mother died with him. And for from that day on, she showed no affection for any living being. I grew up in a silent home without laughter and without faith. So when Max grew up and he married his wife Grace and he started to have kids, he was determined that his own children's childhood would not be like the one he had to experience. They had four children, Diane and Michael and Craig and Ruth. And it was Craig's temperament, above all, that he said, laid low my childhood pessimism. He said, even when he was first born, he had this infectious smile that just uh, lit everybody up. At three years old, when they would be visiting somebody's house, he would walk up proudly to the hostess and say, you have a beautiful house. When he received a gift, Max said he would be moved to tears, and then he would give it away to the first child who envied him. On Sundays, as his mom dressed uh, to sing in the choir, he would never forget to say, you're beautiful. Well, all of that changed six days before Christmas in 1958, when now five-year-old Craig was struck and killed by a speeding car. He'd been walking to school, and the car had sped through the uh, safety crosswalk stop signal. 
Max and Grace drove home from the hospital, not believing what had just happened, until finally when they got home, they saw Craig's empty bed. All night long, Max said, I searched what I knew of life for some hint of a loving God at work in it, and I found none. If such a child as Craig can die in a moment, then life is meaningless. Faith in God is self-delusion. Now the next morning, uh, Max's grief found a target. 15-year-old George Williams was arrested two states over in Tennessee. He came from a broken home. His, the uh, mother worked a night shift. And on this particular day before, he had skipped school. And while the mom was sleeping, he stole the keys and sped off in the car and got the road. George called his lawyer. Get him tried as an adult. Juvenile court's not tough enough. But late that night, something happened that changed Max's life. He said it happened in the space of time that it takes to walk two steps. He was pacing in the hallways that was next to all of the bedrooms, feeling sick and dizzy. His hands were on his head and he prayed, Oh God, show me why. Right then, the breath went out of me in a great sigh, and with it all the sickness. In its place was a feeling of love and joy, so strong it was almost pain. Someone, an actual person, filled that hallway with love. The vengefulness, the hate, the anger, they were suddenly gone. They didn't melt away, they were just like you wake up and they were just part of a dream that's now gone. Max felt that while he was standing there in the hallway, that he was also somewhere else at the same time. And from that place, that newer place, everything looked different. There, there was a knowing beyond words that he just couldn't express. He could sense Craig's life was there in this other place. And there was a purpose for life that was beyond his conception. He just knew it was good and right. And somehow this life we live now is supposed to give way to that life. Max didn't know how long it actually took that he was in there, uh, but the next step he took, he was at the doorway to his bedroom. And he must have looked different because his wife Grace, instead of staring blankly ahead, as she had done all day long, gasped. And she sat up straight. He went to her and he poured out as many words as he could trying to describe what had just happened and how life had had a purpose and the purpose was good beyond our furthest hopes. And after he paused, he said, I know tonight Craig is beyond needing us, but someone else needs us. George Williams. It's almost Christmas. There'll be no gift for him in the detention center unless we send him. Grace burst into tears. That's right. It's the first thing that's been right since Craig died. The rightness continue as the Lord worked through Max and Grace. Yes, there was a gift at the detention center for George. There was a tin of cookies for his mother back at her house. But a few days later, they asked for and got his release from the detention center. And over the next few years, their house became a second home for George Williams. Max took him under his wing into a shop and had him doing work in, the, in his uh, instrument shop. Then he would be invited over for dinner. He became like a sibling to the other three children. Tragedy, yes, but Max's perspective changed in that moment when I met Christ. Life may seem like a veil of tears. But the message of the first Christmas is that life has purpose and a goodness beyond our furthest hopes. Because this child in the 
manger is who he is. The Lord's word for all of us is being fulfilled. And that word is a word of love and joy greater than any sorrow. The sufferings of this present time, as the Bible said, aren't worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed. And all because in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word became flesh. And He dwelt among us, full of grace 